historical town of Horn. And this uh, was the statue of, is the statue of Jan Pieterszoon Koen. And he is the subject of my 20 minute uh, presentation. Uh, who was he? Um, why were there protests against his statue? And what is the West Fries Museum's attitude and response towards these protests? Well, to uh, start with the first question, uh, Jan Pieterszoon Kuhn is a, uh, a very well-known and much disputed historical figure in the Netherlands. You will find his name in every school book and his legacy even reaches out to the Javanese Wayang Theater where he appears as Mur Yang Kung. Uh, Kung lived in the first part of the 17th century and played an important role in the Dutch uh, trade expansion to Asia and in the history of the Dutch East India Company, the VOC. In 1618, after a 11 year career in the company, he reached the highest position in the hierarchy of the VOC, that of governor general. And he exercised this office twice, from 1618 until 1623, and from 1627 until his death in 1629. Jan Pieterszoon Kuhn was a man of ambition, often ahead of his time in his ideas. As director general, he managed to reorganize the VOC. And as governor general, he conquered the port city of Jayakarta in 1619 by force, burned it to the ground and founded Batavia that not only became the administrative headquarter of the VOC, but also the rendezvous for all trade with the Netherlands and the inter-Asiatic trade, which Kuhn successfully initiated. Under his rule, the VOC became profitable for the first time. So you could claim that Jan Pieterszoon Kuhn laid the foundation for the latter success of the company. In the way he achieved this, he showed himself a Machiavellist, meaning that to him, the end justified the means, even if this meant the use of brutal force. In 1621, he took a considerable army to the Banda Islands in order to enforce the monopoly on nutmeg and foil. When negotiations failed, he took military action and gave the order to execute 24 Orankaya or elders. Thousands of Bandanese were killed in the hostilities that went on for several months and thousands others fled into the mountains and died of starvation. The Bandanese left, were deported into slavery or had to work on the nutmeg plantations now run by Dutch settlers, the so-called Perkeneers, who also used slaves from other islands in the Indonesian archipelago to do the hard work. This made the Banda Islands the first Dutch colony that ran on a system of slavery. In the 19th century, in the heat of nationalism and colonialism slash imperialism, Jan Pieterszoon Kuhn was praised by the Dutch for his achievements and proclaimed a national hero. A statue uh, for Kuhn was erected in Batavia in 1873, a statue that was torn down 
by Indonesian nationalists in 1942 with the approval of the Japanese. And in 1893, there was also a statue erected in Horn, the town where Kuhn was born in 1587. And until the Second World War, wreaths were laid at the monument every year, sometime by the Queen Wilhelmina herself. After the independence of Indonesia, Kuhn lost his relevance as a national hero. And from the 1960s, 60s, along with a growing criticism on Dutch colonial past, Kuhn was more and more criticized for his ideas and especially his brutal use of violence. Former a hero, he became a symbol of everything that was wrong about colonialism, which also led to protests against his statue early as the 1960s. To the descendants of the victims of Dutch colonial rule and post-war treatment, especially the Moluccans, the monument is regarded as a painful memory and an offense to their ancestors' history. They want it removed from public space. And that, that's what the protests last summer were partly about. But the opponents of the statue meet opposition. Still a big part of the population in the Netherlands and in Horn, although they admit to the violence used by Kuhn, don't want to get rid of his statue for several and different reasons. One of them is that the deeds of Kuhn should not be judged by contemporary 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 moral standards. And this argument could also be heard in 2011, when the statue was severely debated. I want to tell you how the West Fries Museum responded to this debate. It gives you an idea how the museum takes up its responsibility in this matter. And for this project, it was rewarded the Europa Nostra Cultural Heritage Award in 2014. I will start a short presentation now called the Kuhn case. I hope it works. Do you see my presentation? No? Okay. I'll try it uh, otherwise. Sorry for this uh, technical um, problem.
um, up. Maybe you can send it to use the film. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, there it is. There it is. You see? Um. Can you see the movie? No, we see now a, a screen. Um, we see a um, um, email screen. Okay. Right now. Um, maybe you can send it to uh, use so that maybe she can she can try to uh, get it working from from her uh, part. Yeah. Um, okay. It, I, I'm so sorry. It 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 worked. Uh, it worked just a few minutes ago. Yeah, I know. It's always uh, the same, you know. Uh, I'll. I'll uh... Yeah. I have it right here. I'm going to share it. Right. Do you see it? Do you see the movie? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I will start right away. So this is a short presentation called The Coon Case. And it's about a, 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 a project the museum did in uh, 2012. This is the statue of VLC icon Jan Pietersson Kuhn. For almost 130 years, the bronze governor general of the Dutch Indies and founder of Batavia looks over the Rode Steen, the central square of the city of Hoorn. In 2011, the statue became the center of a heated debate. Opponents collected signatures. They wanted Kuhn to be taken off his pedestal. Mass murderers don't deserve statues, was their opinion. But others think this was going too far. Hands of GP. He may be a crook, but he's still our crook, a local councilman stated. The debate touched a raw nerve. Even well outside Horen, it raised the question how the Dutch want to deal with their past and with their proclaimed national heroes. How can and should they be judged? For weeks, the debate dominated the news and the internet, and even national television, the eight o'clock news, covered the story. Who would have thought Jan Pieterson Kuhn a trending topic? So what do you do as a historical museum? The statue is almost on your doorstep and you aspire to be an inclusive museum that covers the 17th century and uh, that focuses on making connections between the past and the present. Well, we changed our program to address the issue. But the question was, how should we do it? What value could the museum add to the debate? What was striking was how strongly the debate engaged people. Everyone had an opinion on the matter, but the debate was often simplified by black and white thinking. Uh, Kuhn was a crook or he was a hero and there weren't any other flavors while historical figures like Kuhn are fascinating because of their many faces. So it became the, the museum's main challenge to find a format for a presentation that encouraged as many people as possible to form their own opinion based on facts and various views on Kuhn as a historical figure. And we found just that, the Kuhn case, uh, exhibition in the form of a trial with Kuhn as the accused and a genuine charge, Jan Pieterson Kuhn is not worthy of a statue. Of course, 
the case was clearly structured and presented with the pros and cons of the charge, supported by a lot of physical evidence and expert witnesses, both for the prosecution and for the defense, and an appealing judge, a popular historian and television personality whose verdict everyone wanted to know. And with the visitor as a member of the jury, expected to give a verdict, but only after studying all the evidence pro and con, and on the condition that their judgment was supported by solid arguments. This proved a good format, allowing the visitor to develop an opinion in a well-founded and engaging way, while the museum encouraged and facilitated the debate without forcing an opinion on anyone. So this was a, a textbook example of a participating museum. Of course, the exhibition was supported by a solid promotional campaign given a boost by a small scandal about a parody on the exhibition poster. And uh, you, you will see the parody right away. Uh, instead of Kuhn, they uh, placed the face of Hitler on the poster. But the poster was, of course, included in the exhibition right away as an opinion. At the same time, the museum published a genuine glossy, a personal magazine called Kuhn, easy to read, but with many facts, stories, opinions, and points of view on Kuhn as a historical figure. Of course, there were school programs in which students held a life trial with prosecuting and defense lawyers. And there were plenty of other activities as well, like the Story Room Project, in which eight people talked about their connection to Kuhn in 20 minutes. And the end result was a project that appealed to the people, that met a need and contributed substantially to the debate, with no fewer than 10,000 visitors, 3,000 of them being school children, over 1,100 magazines sold, and the most satisfying result, more than 3,000 verdicts supported by arguments. The project brought the museum a lot of goodwill among local politicians and citizens and great publicity as well, new collaborations, and the conviction that a historical museum dealing with the 17th century can be a relevant and lively part of society. And Kuhn, what about him? He's still looking out over the square, or rather, he's looking out over the square again, because to the amusement of many, the bronze cultural icon was knocked off his pedestal by a careless lorry driver. And this added a new world to the Dutch vocabulary, Kooning, having your picture taken on the pedestal of Koon. Since the spring of 2012, the pedestal has featured a new bilingual text by way of compromise resulting from the debate in the City Council of Horn, written by the museum. And it includes a QR code and a telephone a number. This QR code gives you access to a website. And when you call the telephone number, you will hear, hi, this is good. I'm glad you've called. I can talk to you right now, but leave the message after the beep. And many people left their message of what they thought about Kuhn. 
Okay, this was 2012. Next year, it will be 400 years ago that the massacre on the Banda Islands took place. And I am sure this will stir up the debate over Kuhn and his statue again. The city of Horn recently, and in response to the protests last summer, took the initiative for a series of city talks in which inhabitants can discuss the future of the statue with each other. Uh, um, uh, we're, we're all, we, we have to wrap up in, in one or two minutes. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm almost at the end. Okay. Okay. Uh, the West Fries Museum once again takes up its responsibility. Together with several Dutch and Moluccan experts, we are preparing a bilingual online exhibition, a digital presentation is a better word, on the Banda Islands, in which many perspectives on the historical events of 1621 its history and aftermath will be made accessible to a broad audience everywhere in the world. This presentation called Pala, Nutmeg Tales, will be launched early May 2021. To conclude my presentation, referring to the title of today's talk, Jan Pieterson Kuhn has it all. He was a conqueror. For a long time, he was a national hero and to a substantial part of the Dutch population, because of his wickedness, his statue should be removed. If that's the case, then the West Fries Museum would be an excellent place to preserve this interesting monument, which reflects on the changing views on Dutch colonial past. Thank you for your attention and sorry for the technical problems. Thank you very much, Mr. Geerling. Very, very, very interesting um, to hear about uh, somebody who is also very, very known in Indonesia, I think, but uh, just, just very one-sidedly. And uh, now we go to um, our next speaker. I'm not sure whether that would be um, Bonnie Triana or Alkis Lukman. Um, I think... Uh, Bonnie has just arrived, so I'm not sure who who will ask um, who will go first. Maybe uh, maybe uh, Paalkis first, so that Bonnie has time to uh, prepare to get settled. Yeah. Uh, so we will have uh, our next speaker, uh, Paalkis Lukman from uh, Jakarta, from uh, uh, to talk about Depok. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Okay, um, my name is Alkis Lukman and I work for National Archaeology Research Center in Indonesia. And firstly, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizer of this webinar, especially Bajang, Buyus, Bulinawati, and Mas Adrian to inviting me to this uh, very awesome webinar. And um, I would like to share screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. I would like to talk about uh, the memories of Cornelis Castellin. This project is in 2018 in collaboration with Department of Archaeology, Universitas Indonesia. And I would like, firstly, I would like to talk about the location of Depok. Depok is a city located in the southern part area of Jakarta. As you can see in the picture on, on the map, Jakarta is uh, the northern part. And this is the western part of Java. And Depok is located exactly at the south of Jakarta. And it has many colonial remains. Why it has colonial remains? Then we have to talk about Cornelis Castellin. In the 17th century, Depok was an agricultural area owned by a high-ranking VOC member called Cornelis Castellin. 
uh, Depok at that time is different from Depok we see today. Depok uh, was built uh, between Mampang on the west. Uh, it's now uh, about 20 kilometers uh, difference between now and then. And also at the west is Pasanggrahan River. And Kastlin, Kastlin uh, brought many slaves from Bali, Maluku, and other part of eastern part of Indonesia for working at his land. Different from the other landowner at the time, he taught his slave the Dutch language and how to be a considered civilized, civilized society at the time, and also bring Christianity to them. Kastlin had the idea and belief that there was only one way to make the colonies in the Indies prosper. According to Kastlin, the colony will not have survived without the support of local people. The social inequality between European people and local communities will create potential resistance and causing instability in the colony. Kastlin proposed the worker at agriculture area can fulfill their own needs if a healthy agricultural area had been formed, the colony would have functionally optimal. At the end of his life, Castellan created a testament to liberate his slave and gave his land at Depok to them. Uh, for besides, uh, in his will, he bequeathed the Depok area to his worker who had embraced Christianity. Uh, they inherited about 30, 300 buffalo, two gamelan with gold decoration, and all of his money, and all of his uh, silver plated spear. Uh, the the uh, the this, his slave is uh, contain about twelve families <coughs> families names that can be uh, arranged by. Uh, they called like Bacas, Isaacs, Jacobs, Jonathans, Josephs, Lawrence, Lander, Loon, Samuel, Sudira, Tolens, and Zadok. Uh, all of the names, uh, maybe uh, you can see the similarity in the, the family names from the Bible. Uh, this uh, small Christian community initially consists about 200 peoples from all of the area that uh, original originated from the Castellan slave. Okay, after the death of Cornelius Castellan, yeah, until the the end of 19th century, uh, the right to use of the epoch when officially continued to apply based on his will. Even though in 19, in 1871, the board administration of Netherlands in this. Uh, make uh, form an ex executive body to, to create uh, as uh, I hope I can pronounce it uh, uh, head best fun particular land of the epoch or the municipal board of private land of the epoch. However, the term of Gemente best tour in the epoch's private land area cannot be equated with the term of Gemente or municipality in the 20, 21st century because the, this term is uh, referred to an agency in charge of managing community interest in the private land. The responsible person is called himself as president by his citizens. It can be said that the president in the community is actually a representative of former slaves who were inherited from Castling. The depot president is democratically elected by members of the community every three years. And the president is not a landlord, but the coordinator of the board from municipality. As you can see in the picture on the right, this, that's uh, how the depot situation around 1847. Okay, now I would like to talk about how the descendants of Castellan slave. As you see this picture, this is a uh, the first doctor of uh, the first doctor from 
Kastelein uh, slave. Uh, his name is Riklov Johannes Loon, as you can see at the upper left on the picture, and his family. Uh, the former slaves and their families grew into spirit community in Depok actually because they they have like three uh, community. First one is the descendants of Castellan slave, or we call it Blanda Depok now, or Orang Depok Lama, and Orang Kampung, which uh, mostly is a Muslim in the Peri Peri area, and also the immigrant from other parts of Indonesia. Or, and also the, the last one is a Chinese and we can talk about it later. Okay, as you can see like uh, how they dress is like, uh, and how they talk and how they appropriate manner in the picture, you can see as they are already integrated to the society. And, and that's why we call them is Blanda Depok. Okay, for the legacy of the Cornelis Castellin, uh, I see is there is there are two legacy that we can see today. First one is about religion, which is Christian. Uh, in my opinion, it's not only Christian and faith that the Castellin gave to his slave, but the most important thing is his free, freeing his slave from illiteracy. The, the slaves uh, can speak in Dutch and write in Dutch. So they e make it easier to the people to integrate to other society. That's why uh, many Depos people working as uh, official gov uh, government officer and also uh, other job that cannot be taken by other local communities in Indonesia. And the second one is uh, the sanctuary area in Depok. As we can see, it's still today. Uh, based on the archive that I studying, that floats were a frequent topic of discussion uh, at the Ratvan Indi meetings during Castellan's tenure. According to Castellan, the cause of the flood was due to the absence of water reservoir in the upstream area of the Chiliwen River. That's why he created a sanctuary covering our area about 6,000 hectares and his slave and every people around that area is forbid to cut the trees at the area. As you can see in the picture on the right, uh, that's the remains of Castellan's sanctuary today, but because of the modernization and people needs to create the settlements uh, currently only is six hectares left. I think. And I will talk about the monument of Cornelis Castellin. To commemorate the death of Cornelis Castellin, his day, the day of his death being used as a memorial day called Depok Dach, or the born of this Depok city, the day of the born of the city. And in the celebration of the 200th anniversary of Castellin's date, uh, in 1914, for, in 1914, the Cornelis Castellan was built uh, as initiative by the president at the time called Johannes Matthijs Jonathans. As you can see at the picture at the right. And also the monuments is become the central area for Depox people to create ceremony or anything uh, maybe uh, sacred to them to place a public public uh, event over there. However, after the independence of Indonesia, maybe it's not actually independence for Depok people because the social inequality uh, happened between Blanda Depok and other pe dep uh, people at Depok. Um, it, it's like a massacre at Depok called Kedoran Depok because uh, every people they bang the door or gedor, gedor, gedoran in Indonesian, so it's called Kedoran Depok. So around for 
4,000 people are attacked and many people were slaughtered on that day. Okay, and this is one of the survivor. Is his name is Hovert Sudira. Yeah, he was uh, 55 years old at that time, and he remembered being gathered at the Gemeente Gebouw or municipality with his her brother and his brother and his mother. And yeah, luckily the Nika soldiers came before they could burn them. And as you can see in the picture on the right, that's the picture 10 years after when they were moving to Bandung. And since the Godoran Depok, many Depok people or Belanda Depok cannot uh, live again in the Depok actually. And Hovart himself uh, is migrate to Depok until 1980s. Migrate to Netherlands, I mean, sorry. Okay, and after the independence of Indonesia, Castellan's monuments is destroyed, was destroyed by uh, official governments. Uh, actually, I really don't know the cause of the dis dis distractions, but uh, the some versions called that it's about because the monument hindered the mobility of army convoy. And the other vision is about uh, Trikora, because like so Sukarno doesn't like a really monument that related to colonial period. So many monuments at the time, especially in Jakarta, was removed from the public places. Okay. Now, how about the colonial heritage in the epoch? The colonial heritage, as you can see in the picture, that's about the land heist of Monoshina. At that time, uh, Chinese people cannot enter the area of of uh, Astlands agriculture area, but they made um, settlements around surrounded area. So this one is one of the uh, legacy uh, we can see today. As you can see, uh, the picture uh, in 2001, it's still intact, completely intact, but in 2014, only the front facade is already left. Everything is already gone. And the other part is, the other case is the case of land heist of Chimangis. The central government planned to demolish this house for the construction of the Universitas Islam Indonesia in 2017. And the vice president of Indonesia at that time uh, stayed at the newspaper said, this house is owned by a corrupt invader. It is time to move on. And what we want to make is Indonesian future. Uh, as you can see here, like, um, yeah, we can see the government of Indonesia would like to eradicate the colonial remain in Depok try, and try to create a new history on top of it. However, the Belanda Depok using YLCC or Yayasan Lembaga Cornelis Castellin would like to reestablish again of the memory, uh, the memory of the Castellin. He would like to create a new monument on the, the at the existing, existing place of the Castellan's monument. But the government banned the establishment because first one is the LCC people would like to put Castellan's hope in his will that say about the, my intention is that a beautiful Christian population grows in Depo, that it's not already related to current Depo society and can create other uh, horizontal conflict in Depo. And another case is because uh, it's still, Castellan's monuments is uh, considered as uh, colonial remains, colonial, uh, colonial memories, then why we should have to preserve them. But the LCC still arguments and create some publication about this and Although Carlos Castellan, when they say it, although Carlos Castellan was a colonizer, he had many contribution in forming current Depok city. 
And the moment is not only to preserve memories of the old Depok people, but also represent the story of the development of Depok City. And they are agreed to remove the inscription containing the Castellan's hope, which no longer fits the context of the present day of Depok society. Uh, in the picture, there's uh, Yano Jonathans, who are the people uh, who is giving the initiative to reestablish the Conley's Castellan. But today, uh, after kind of uh, some of arguments, the monuments is come back to erected again at the place uh, now right now is uh, in front of the Harapan Hospital at Depok. Uh, before that is a municipality building. Okay, and as you can see uh, at the below pictures, most of the coffee shop restaurants or anything like using using the castellan's memory to give a new value for uh, added value to to bring like economic prosper to them as as we can see like before the governments uh afraid to create again uh any colonial memories to, uh, in depot but as we can see after the re-establishment of the colonial past uh, lanes monuments, many people uh, create some pictures or some uh, decoration for their business. Okay, and I would like to talk a bit about my project. It's called the Poklama Project. It's our... Mm -hmm. Sorry? We have we have about we have a few minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I will okay. It up. okay. Okay. This is our project about how to preserve colonial heritage step of, of the epoch digitally, and we conduct interviews with the descendants of Castellan slave, academician, and local history society. And the website itself is talk about three themes, which are. Uh, Cornelius Castellan himself, the Gone site of the old Depok peoples, and the historical buildings in Depok. This website can be accessed at Depok Lama Project, but unfortunately, it's only available, available in Indonesia. Okay, and you can play the opinion from the inter, from our informants directly at the website. Okay, as our epilogue. Yeah, in Indonesia, mostly all of the historical event, we trust about the state archive or official archive, but we are not acknowledging about the perspective of common people or other people that can not really minority of their times. And perhaps this is the time for us to focus inward and strengthening our local base of support because this is what is more likely to ensure our heritage existence. Okay, thank you for your time. And I will give it back to Ibulina. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Pa Alkis, for, for a very, very interesting um, talk, uh, probably about something that uh, a lot of us uh, don't know about, the person that, uh, that nobody knows much about, that now we do. And uh, now we um, go on to our uh, last speaker, uh, Pak Boni Triana. Uh, Hello. Is he here? I'm here. Oh. Okay. Hello. Sorry for Hello. late coming to the okay. room. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was my fault, actually. No. Uh -huh. Everything, everything uh, turned out okay. So please go okay, ahead. Okay, Marina. Uh, thank you uh, for having me to this uh, virtual uh, discussion. And I would like to express my gratitude to Mbak Yus and also Mbak Lina and Ajahn who invite me to join with this discussion. But first of all, I would like to say, uh, apologize if my English is not really fluent. And I would like to ask Mbak Lina to translate some word if I fail to find any word in English. So I don't have a PowerPoint or I don't have a slide to show, to share in this uh, discussion, but it doesn't mean I don't have power and, and 
and Poin to talk. I'm going to talk about Multatuli. Well, uh, this historical figure, very famous, at least uh, for the last three years, after Multatuli Museum being open in Rangas Bitung at my hometown. So uh, let me read my my contekan. Uh, I would like to start uh, my talk today with sharing my childhood story in Rangkas Bitung. I was born in Rangkas Bitung, uh, the place where Edward Dawes-Dacker served as a resi uh, assistant resident from January to April 1859, uh, sorry, 56. Yeah. So when I was a student uh, of elementary school, Multatuli was only known as the name of the street uh, that crosses uh, in front of my uh, primary school where I was studied there. And at that time, almost no one, including me at that time, knew who Multatuli was. Uh, the only story that circulated among people in my hometown, in Rangkas Bitung, in Lebak, uh, only the story about the Dutch ghost who always ride the horse across the small road to the back of a public hospital where the uh, Lebak assistant resident, official residence was once uh, located. And maybe this is sounds hilarious, right? Uh, many people of my hometown perceive, maybe perceive colonialism as a ghost, a beard as a, a Dutchman riding a horse. Uh, meanwhile, in other cities, we always heard a story about the Dutch ghost that stay in the old building and always haunting people who stay there until late at night. And then um, the history of colonialism in Indonesia is often understood as a simple as black or white, which often feels colonialism as a simply a picture of white domination over color uh, people, which is uh, not entire, entirely uh, wrong, but by uh, ignoring the power of st structure of colonialism, uh, colonialism which involved local feudalism in the, you know, manage the Dutch East Indies, it sort of has a, a potential uh, 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 to create uh, uh, racially biased historical perspective. And I think this perspective lead us to, to the distortion of historical reality. And at the same time, uh, it make us fail to understand the condition of the society today that result of the past process. Uh, in other hand, uh, the incomplete way of teaching history in, uh, about colonial era and the racist bias in uh, history teaching in Indonesia seems to have uh, made multatuli and not become important topic in history in Indonesia. I never, I never learned about multatuli when I was school. I never uh, read. Uh, uh, Max Havler when I was school, because this book this book uh, was never be uh, what you call it mandatory book that give to to the student uh, and then make student have to read this book. I never learned about I never read about this book, and then as the result, you know there are a lot of misunderstood to Multatuli as the result of uh, racialist bias in our uh, history teaching, history as a subject at school. When Multatuli Museum was established, I mean in the process uh, uh, in 2000 and around 2015 and 2016, there were some students went to the street they protesting this museum because they accuse 
the local government of being uh, Dutch oriented or the Dutch henchmen. What is in Indonesia, Antek Belanda, something like that. It sounds so, you know, uh, negative. Uh, I believe that these students are never read Max Havler, as I also, uh, uh, you know, it's like to me when I was a student. We never read his book, and as the result, we always, you know, cannot make difference between what colonialism and then what is uh, multatuli. And then I would like to make my uh, discussion today into three parts. Uh, first, I would like to see Mutatuli from the perspective of personal point of view. So Mutatuli as a Daoist Decker, as an assistant resident. And secondly, I would like to uh, discuss histor uh, Mutatuli or Daoist Decker from uh, the perspective of writer. So he is as the writer. And uh, from him, he, we got uh, Max Havler. I think Max Havler is the outer ego of Daoist Decker. And then the third, I would like to talk about the impact of this novel to Indonesia that inspiring many Indonesian prominent uh, nationalist leader yeah, and you know to awakening their uh, nation consciousness would say like that you know uh, we have a lot of critics to mutatuli two of the famous uh, critics uh, came from rob newman house and also hell has hell has have seen uh, Mutatuli as a person that always uh, doing party, uh, womanizer, and then involve a lot of, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, gambling, and then also uh, he loved to drink until hangover. So Hela has uh, uh, seen Mutatuli as a person who, you know, not really authentic if uh, compared to what he had written in his novel. So that is actually a personal point of view. So, so actually, it has nothing to do with, with the novel itself. And Hela has uh, criticized him because that was Decker seems like not really an uh, authentic person. And secondly, Rob Nivenhuis also doing a, a, a criticize uh, Mutatuli. Uh, Rob said that uh, uh, Mutatuli failed to understand the local custom in Lebak. That was as that was Decker, of course. That is not Mutatuli. That is that was Decker. That was Decker fail to understand the local custom. Rob said, uh, for many years, people of Lebak serve their own leader. So, you know, the, the word of, you know, uh, uh, Heron Dinston. So, Rob, uh, uh, Rob said that this is part of the local culture. This is part of the local custom of Lebak. The people served Bupati, and they uh, they didn't get any uh, money from that. And for uh, Rob Dewan Heiss, uh, this is something normal. And then when those Decker seen this, uh, what you call it, seen this uh, a phenomenon as something wrong. And then. Uh, that is a critic from Hela Hase and Rob Newman Heiss, which is uh, do not agree at all. And 
the third is we have to admit the impact of uh, sorry before I'm talking about the impact I'm, I'm going to talk about Mutatuli as the writer he wrote a very good novel and the discussion about this novel whether it is a fact or a fiction I just finished a movie documentary movie about Mutatuli to celebrate 200 years of Mutatuli the title of uh, documentary movie is Nadat Mutatuli Vertrok or After Mutatuli Left. So we went to Badur. Badur is uh, the desa where Saija and Adinda uh, was born. You know, Saija and Adinda is uh, a two main character in uh, Mutatuli novel, Max Haflar. And we went there. We met uh, uh, people there and we make an interview and then uh, we met one of uh, people from desa she never graduated from elementary elementary school then uh, she went to jakarta for work as a labor and then it reminds me the same story of adinda who never had an access to education. So the situation in Badur, the desa where Saija and Adinda uh, was born, is stay the same. So I, I see the, what you call it, the, uh, the red line that, that connect the past to the present. This is what uh, I found in Desa Badur. So it similar with uh, the story that Mutatuli have written on his novel about Saija Adinda. So if the debate, if the discussion only uh, talking about whether this novel fact or fiction, I think the uh, the current condition of people who live in Desa Badur today is just like the same with Saija Adinda two centuries ago. So still relevant. So this novel is still relevant. And the third, what about the impact of this novel? Uh, many Indonesian nationalist leaders read this novel. One of them was Ahmad Subarjo, our first uh, 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 foreign minister of Republic of Indonesia. Uh, on his memoir, he said that he was inspired by this novel when he was still uh, study in the uh, primary school in the, in, in the late colonial era. And Ahmad Subarjo said he was inspired by Mutatuli because Mutatuli uh, wrote a very interesting story about how Hello? are exploited by two kind of uh, power, colonialism, I mean colonial master and feudal, the aristocracy. And then uh, not only Amar Subarjo, Sukarno also uh, 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 quote Mutatuli on his play doi, on his speech in front of uh, colonial uh, uh, judge in Landrat in Bandung in 1930. So actually this book has inspired many nationalist leaders in Indonesia. But now many uh, people, not only in my hometown, in, in, in Lebak, in Rangkas Bitung, because they never, they, uh, they didn't read these novels. And then don't have any reference to this novel. And sometimes they have a sort of a misunderstood to this novel and consider Multatuli as part of colonialism, 
which is uh, uh, not true at all. Yes, he will serve as assistant resident, part of colonial bureaucracy, but as a writer, he was a different person. He was a, uh, uh, yeah, I have to say that uh, Mutatuli didn't want to get rid of colonialism from Indonesia. He just want to make a, a, a system more fair for the people. He was like a, a human rights activist in, in the colonial era, I would say like that. And then uh, for me, it is uh, very interesting to see Mutatuli as a, what you call it, uh, regarding to Pramudia Anantatur, he was the first man who tried to kill colonialism. But at least it was like a snowball that rolling and become big and bigger and then involve a lot of people, involve a lot of Indonesian prominent uh, nationalist leader to have uh, awareness as a, as a as a nation, as a uh, yeah, as a nation, as a new nation, as a new people, as a oppressed people that want to uh, get um, uh, independence from colonialism. I think there is from me. I would like to say I'm really sorry for not being systematical in explaining uh, Mutatuli to all of you. But I think we can uh, uh, discuss in the next session. Thank you, Marina. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mas Boni. Um, maybe now we can, uh, we have uh, some questions um, and I will read, read, them, uh, read them out to you. Um, the first one, uh, one question is from uh, Sadia Bonstra, and I will write it. I will read it out. I noticed that the colonial figures discussed today are all men, and that they are presented by an all male panel except for the female moderator. How can we make sure that we also include and look for female and other intersectional voices and perspectives in Indonesian history? And how can we look beyond the usual colonial figures with the exception of perhaps Kartini to write new histories, including female voices? Um, maybe, um, can we maybe start with uh, uh, Pa Alkis and then, and then uh, Adrian and then Bonnie to, to have a short uh, reaction to this, uh, to this question? Okay, about the gender equality of story. Uh, yeah. That's a good question, <laughs> actually. Um, that's a good question, but honestly, I don't have any good answer for it. Uh, the first one is like all of them, um, when I conduct study about uh, Cornelis Castellates, I don't think uh, of, my informants, it's not only men who, who studying or the descendants is men, but also women. How 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 the how they live when before 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 Indonesians independence at the depot during that time. But the problem is uh, not so many women that can uh, still alive today and can tell the story. His story story about the depox uh, the story but the and yeah but I think the story about the colonial figures uh, we in Indonesian we have we also have uh, many women's uh, hero Indonesian national hero women's like Chutna Din or uh, Christiana who are many other uh, heroes in Indonesia. So I think the question about the female, you know, in Indonesia, maybe it's quite uh, balanced about the men and women to talk about 
uh, Indonesian hero. Maybe that's my answer. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, it's uh, a matter of, uh, of choice and, um, and perseverance because when you look at the usual colonial fi figures, uh, they're all men, uh, especially in the 17th century, um, they're mainly uh, men and uh, you have to do more, um, uh, more effort to find out about uh, the women in, um, in those days. And uh, well, uh, if you want to, uh, I, I, I fully agree that we should focus more on um, the lives of, uh, and contribution of, uh, of, of women, um, but that's, that's more hard work. So uh, I think it's a matter of choice if you want it, um, uh, you uh, can focus on uh, on the women, and uh, uh, I think uh, when when you make that choice, uh, we'll 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 um, bring uh, the, the most beautiful uh, stories uh, into the light. Um, Moni, maybe you have a you have a. No, I cannot hear the voice clearly because it's raining here. <laughs> yeah, but okay, talking about a woman in, in Indonesian history or in the colonial history, uh, my concern is that we have a two problems. First, I think about a, what you call it, about the paradigm. Of, I don't know, maybe this is something, uh, maybe this is uh, not uh, true, but, and secondly, about the technical thing is how to find the sources, historical sources about the woman. Uh, I would like to tell my own experience when I, with my friend, of course, in Historia, when we decided to publish our first edition of Historia print version, we decided to uh, make a story of two Indonesian women prominent uh, a, a leader. First, Eskatri Murti, and secondly, a Maria Ulfa, which is now become, uh, I think, become name of the street in Amsterdam. Yeah, uh, Eskatri Murti and Maria Ulfa. Uh, it is not easy to, to, to get the historical Sources. Of course, it is not a, a uh, excuse, of course. But uh, I do agree that we have to uh, dig more information about the uh, uh, woman in colonial history. Because as we understand the history of colonial Indonesia, when we start talk, when we when we see, for example, uh, FAOC. When they came to, 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 to this archipelago in around in 16th century, there were no women at all. And that's why Dutch people who live here at that time had Dutch lady, actually a pillow. <laughs> or in, in Bahasa Bantal Guling, right? As a, as a friend, <laughs> friend <laughs> in, in, in the bedroom. So, woman history in 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 uh, uh, woman in in colonial history is a very important topic. Uh, we once published an article about the first woman. Uh, uh, what you call it? The 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 rat. What is not the false rat, but the cement rat, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember the name, but it was the Dutch woman who first elected, not elected, sorry, appointed as a member of a, a local parliament. And then that was in colonial uh, period. Mm -hmm. And uh, this appointment uh, sparks a discussion and debate among Indonesian uh, women movement. 
I think that it was in 1930s, around 1930s, because we have the first uh, uh, woman uh, congress in 1928 on December uh, 20, 22 December of 1928. So actually, woman is important topic in uh, colonial history and. For example, for my uh, topic today about Mutatuli, for example, yes. Linda is a woman, so it symbolizes the common people, the lower class of a people in Lebak. Uh, even though um, when we talk about Mutatuli, it is uh, uh, some say that this is, this is a fiction, but it also show how women plays important role. In Banten, we have uh, Nyai Gumparo. She was the leader of women rebellion in Banten around 19th century. And I also put her picture it's not actually not the picture, it's painting. So we assume that that is her painting in the Multatuli Museum to show that women also play important role in against colonialism in in in, in 19th century. Um, Bonnie, can I yeah. ask a quick question in between? Uh, sorry, you say you. Uh, there was a question about uh, the um, um, the documentary that you were talking about. Yeah. The documentary after Multatuli left. Yeah. Will it be released in cinemas in Indonesia and in the Netherlands or maybe in television? Uh, Just a quick uh, kind of. A... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we have been doing this project since uh, years ago, but because of the, con uh, the Corona crisis. Actually, we would like to to screen this movie in Netherlands and in some countries in Europe that has connection or connected to Mutatuli, it's like in Germany, because he was died in Ingelheim. Mm -hmm. But because of Corona crisis, we have to postpone. But we just finished this movie and we sent it uh, to, uh, I don't remember the, the name of the festival, but it is in the Netherlands. So we send it to the festival. Okay. So actually, it is our effort to prove, quote unquote, to prove what Multatuli have written. Because the debate always about whether this is a fiction or a fact. Mm -hmm. So we went to the Badur. Badur is a small desa, not remote, but a small desa in Lebak. You can read this desa name in Multatuli, in Max Havlar novel, then we went there. We made an interview to local people, asking them about the situation, asking them about the condition that they face every day. So it's like a, a trying to prove whether Multatuli is a big liar <laughs> or uh, he telling the truth to us. So, so we will be able, hopefully, to to see. Hopefully, it. hopefully next month we will screen online. Okay. We'll screen it virtually, hopefully. So everyone should be should be looking out for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question to. Um, I think this is for for Mr. Uh, Hearding mostly, but the others, of course, can can also. Um, can also chip in um, from uh, Ina Hutasoi. Interesting to hear that Ye Pei Kun uh, uh, is, is looked as a hero. What is the reason for the Dutch government to abolish Ye Pei Kun as a national hero? Does it not mean to question the Dutch coloni colonialism in Indonesia? Who else besides Ye Pei Kun has been stripped of this uh, hero title, if any. So maybe that's for uh, Mr. Heerding to, uh, to comment on? Yeah. 
thank you, Ina, for your uh, uh, question. I don't think that uh, uh, J.P. Kuhn as a hero was abolished by the government. Um, and it, this is uh, something that happens over time. Uh, uh, a, a person isn't a hero in uh, 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 for it, for itself. It's pro proclaimed a hero, and a hero serves a, a, a meaning. So, in the 19th century, uh, uh, at the height of uh, nationalism in the Netherlands. Uh, and the Netherlands uh, is a very, very small uh, uh, country in, in Europe compared to England, uh, Germany and France. And uh, the small country f felt a little bit threatened. So it needed a, an, an, some kind of national pride. And it found uh, the national pride in uh, uh, the 17th century and in um, uh, our uh, 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 colony in uh, in the Dutch uh, Indies. And when you combine the 17th century and uh, uh, the Dutch Indies, you you um, get J.P. Kuhn. So uh, he was proclaimed a, a, a hero. And after um, the independence of uh, Indonesia and uh, the, the Dutch colonial period got more and more criticized. So uh, Kuhn lost his relevance as a national hero. His statue remained, but he wasn't seen as a national uh, hero uh, uh, anymore. Uh, so uh, it's more uh, a matter of a public opinion than a decision by uh, the government. And um, it also concerns other historical figures from the 17th uh, century. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the Netherlands going on right now about these uh, historical figures. Uh, should we still see them as heroes or just as um, uh, um, people who did uh, things uh, uh, wrong? And um, uh, many of these uh, uh, 19th century heroes, they lose their statues, they want to change uh, uh, street names uh, 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 named after them. So that's, uh, that's what's going on in the Netherlands uh, at, this, uh, at this moment. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Ina. Um, we I we have a question or a comment uh, from Hasti uh, Tarekat. Um, uh, she says, um, "Hang on a second. Um, I learned that decolonization is about uh, rewriting angle and perspective of contested history based on objective facts." If both sides, so the Netherlands and Indonesia do this, then decolonization is a constructive process. It is not necessarily a destructive action, like turning uh, down, uh, like, like uh, you know, breaking down historical figures and statues. Um, I have seen new narrations of Putin in Horn in Amsterdam, uh, exposing uh, positive and um, negative actions. Um, and um, in Horn, there's even a new narration uh, in Indonesian. So let the viewers uh, be their own judge. It's a challenging approach, but healthier for common sense in the long run. So that's what um, um, Hasti is uh, saying. Um, maybe anybody would like to um, to comment if, if, if you agree with her. Um, maybe um, um, Mas Alkis or Bonnie, if, if uh, anybody wants to comment on that. Marina, sorry, I cannot hear freely here. I cannot Hello. hear. It's raining, so. Oh, you can. <laughs> okay. It's, it's better okay. for me to read the question. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe, uh, must. Yeah, must you can speak louder so I can hear you. Sorry. Okay, no, it's okay. 
maybe uh, uh, Mas, Mas Alkis wants to um, comment on that. Okay, yeah, thank you. About, it's about uh, uh, how to preserve a contested history, right? If mm -hmm. I'm not wrong. That's, that's the question, sorry, Polina. Uh, yeah, I, um, because there's it's a- It's raining as well. Oh, the, oh. The, the second question, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, maybe, um, yeah. Comment on on. Uh, yeah, it's a contrast. Uh, uh, I don't know if anybody, everybody can can read it on the on the chat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can read it. Okay. Uh, it's about uh, how to create uh, the rewriting angle about and perspective of contested history. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I'm working in Depok, uh, it's not only about pro Netherlands and pro Indonesians, but also like it has so many uh, fraction uh, um, uh, among the peoples about how do we have to preserve about the coastlines remains. But the important thing is, yeah, all of them is agree. Uh, this deconstructing, decon decon uh, destruction process of uh, colonial heritage is no longer exists in Indonesia. For example, like uh, Sawahunto, as, uh, known as uh, industrial worker Orang Rantai at uh, Sawahunto, uh, it's already become uh, what's called, uh, UNESCO World Heritage. So I think like the important thing is uh, how we accommodate the all of the communities, all of the groups to create a uh, new story and how and let the viewers to interpret by themselves maybe okay yeah. um uh, there were uh i'm sorry uh there were some short questions also uh to mas alkis about specifically about depok if i can see them um um, there's a question from uh, from uh, Irmawati Marwoto. Okay. What is the lesson learned from uh, for the Depo communities and Indonesians concerning uh, contesting uh, the colonial monument that you have uh, mentioned? So what okay. can what can we learn like like the about that? It's yeah, it's actually two questions from Ajeng and Irmawati, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, okay, the first question uh, is from Ajeng. Uh, that's why I create a website to reach the wider audience uh, regarding the Depox. Uh, it's called the depoclamaproject.com. And also for the third questions from Irmawati, what we can run, yeah. That's the thing what I learned, like when we, when uh, as an archeologist, as uh, I'm working in the official government uh, for a research center of archaeology. When we create a story, a history about the people, who is, who is the perfect perspective? Uh, because like, do we have to sacrifice the minority's opinion for better, yeah, better history, historiography, or we have to deny all of the opinions that maybe cross uh, it's not appropriate or something uh, doesn't really fit the context to Indonesian right now. So I think it's better to like create like accommodate all of the stories, all of the uh, opinion of from every aspect not only from the government side, not from official side or from the expertise side, but also from the common people, how, how the heritage affected to them and how they feel about them. Yeah, maybe that's my answer. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is, a, I think this is a bit more of a, like a comment or a, um, to uh, Bonnie. If you can hear me, Bonnie, uh, we from Muhammad Alexander. 
We learned about Multatuli in school as one important figure alongside Dr. Rajiman and Cipto Mangun Kusuma. However, the only fact we know about him is that he is a Dutch person who criticized the BOC government, uh, which in turn uh, enslaved the, the locals at that time. Thanks to you, he said, we could now, uh, we could now uh, dig deeper into his biography. So the Multatuli Museum is, is doing its work, Bonnie, right? So we are um, expecting more also in the future from you, right? You can hear me, right, Bonnie? I'm not sure whether Bonnie can hear me, but anyway. Um, I will, I, there's a question uh, for Adria Dink here from uh, Joella van Donkerschoet. Um, I'll read the question. Uh, an underlying issue in all these comments and presentations is the re reliance on historical facts while history is written by Dutch male colonizers. And even back in the day, actions of Yepi Kun were criticized. Uh, the argument that it was okay back then, therefore does not really apply, she says. In short, there is already a selection made in what is recorded and why it is record recorded. Therefore, maybe decolon decolonizing practices should focus on the legacy of these histories in our present, which is something, uh, we can we cannot uh, reconstruct as an objective past. So uh, maybe uh, Art, you can you can comment on on what uh, Joella said there. Um, yeah, uh, Joella, thank you for your uh, question. Um, I agree uh, with uh, with you that we can't reconstruct an objective past. It's always uh, uh, a perspective on uh, the past, uh, but it's um, uh, very good to know these uh, perspectives and uh, also the background of the era in which these uh, perspectives uh, um, were uh, constructed. So uh, um, if you know the, the late 19th uh, uh, century with uh, uh, nationalists um, uh, impulses, so you can understand why uh, Kuhn was uh, uh, proclaimed uh, a hero. Um, and um, if you want to ask people to uh, make, make up their own opinion on a historical figure, you should give them uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, different views on this uh, historical figure, telling that these are different perspectives on uh, this figure and not the historical truth. So um, uh, I agree with you that um, it's uh, important to focus on uh, uh, on this aspect that that it's always an interpretation uh, uh, of uh, the past. I hope I uh, answered your questions. Um, thank you very much. Um, there is um, another, maybe the the last question. Um, and uh, maybe all, all the three speakers could, could give a short um, comment about this. Um, um, how would, uh, there's, there's this comment from Hans van der Bunte, who said, I agree with uh, Hasti uh, with the previous comment and would like to include the notion that audiences and readers do require the learning ability of interpreting multiple interpretations and an open mindset. So the question is, how would this work in different educational systems and cultural, cultural awareness among communities? Uh, because maybe some, uh, up to now, a lot of these approaches are maybe too academic. So uh, maybe, um, I'm not sure whether, uh, Bonnie, can you hear me? I'm not sure whether uh, he is, there no, I can um, I can hear you I'm trying to hear you because the sound of the rain the rain so hard 
<laughs> okay. So maybe uh, there was there was a maybe question. A tropical country. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. I, saw, I saw two questions for me. Um, it, there's a question from uh, Hans van der Bunte, and uh, he is asking um, how um, um, he said he would like to include the no. Uh, his comment was that he would like to include the notion that audiences and readers do require uh, the learning ability of interpreting multiple interpretations and an open mindset. So how uh, would this work in different educa educational systems and uh, communities? Uh, so, and, and also so that it, it, the approach maybe is not too academic as it sometimes is now. Yeah, <clears throat> actually, actually I don't have any capacity to answer about the system of education, <laughs> but I think we, we yes. can divide uh, education into two, uh, what you call it, two parts. First is uh, education at school and, and uh, education in the public sphere. So in history, we know that we have sort of a public history. So people can learn history. Young audience can, uh, young generation can learn history in museum, in a, uh, a certain historical uh, sites, and and so on and so on. So we have problem in uh, in history as a subject at school. For example, certain topic in our history in Indonesia, we have a very controversial and delicate problem in history. For example, the 1965 cases, right? So mm -hmm. it is a mm, not too complicated actually, unless government have sort of political will to do something with this. And when we talk about the, uh, for example, when we talk about the history of Indonesian revolution between 1945 until 1949, or what Dutch people always say, uh, always perceive, always say as a uh, masa bersiap, which is, I don't uh, fully agree with this term, uh, it also become problematical. So now, sometimes people here seen this period with sentiment, with sentiment anti-Dutch, something you know, something related to patriotism, nationalism, and so and blah 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 blah. It's very emotional, also. Very emotional when the people when it came when it come to topic about this period, it always, you know. Uh, make people being emotionally, being emotional, and then it cannot make us uh, able to think uh, clear and what you call it, yeah, and yeah, objective. I say I don't believe in objectivity, of course, but at least we are trying to, you know, looking at this period as honest as we can okay because maybe we could, um sorry uh we because we're almost out of time so maybe uh, uh at and uh, uh mas alkis can can give a very very short um um reaction to this to to how how do you think this would work in uh you know in the educational system maybe uh at can can talk about uh in the Netherlands and Mas Alkis maybe about Indonesia, very short. Um, Mr. Oh, Mr. Malina. Oh. Can I can I answer a question from Alexander? I think I have to add something with that question. Uh, sure, but very, very short. Yeah. Because we yeah. have that, that, that is not multatuli what I talk today. That, that is 
Setia Budi. Uh, that is, uh, he is a Multatuli cousin. So, oh, that's okay. Multatuli is Edward Dawes Decker, and he has a cousin, uh, Ernest Dawes Decker. So okay. it's a different person. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Art? Um, yeah, um, I think that um, um, critical thinking and the development of a critical um, view on history is already uh, implemented in the Dutch uh, educational uh, uh, system. Uh, when you look at uh, the, the Dutch school books, uh, the, the history is uh, uh, brought uh, uh, from different perspectives on, uh, on history, mainly using uh, different sources. Uh, and uh, of course, it always starts with a, a, an academic approach, but uh, uh, like a, a museum like ours, it's our duty to translate this uh, ap academic approach uh, in an appealing way to the audience. And that's what we tried uh, to do with our uh, project, uh, um, uh, the trial of uh, J.P. Kuhn. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Art, and uh, maybe uh, Paalkis for, for the last comment. Okay, uh, maybe I agree with Art Harding about, uh, yeah, it, I, I didn't have any capacity talking about the formal education system, but for informal education system, like museums has a role to educate and uh, giving a uh, new narration about uh, the colonization matters and also for uh, other souls like um, like uh, what adjuncts did uh, the participant in here and Saiful Bahri maybe talk about the independent education educator museums they create like uh, in the social media talking about uh, contested history talking about uh, spy at, during World War II Indonesian spy during World War II and some things like that it's not only uh, talking about the formal education but uh, we have to also like using uh, informal education, even uh, social media to talk about this matter. Maybe that's my question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, our apologies to uh, others whose questions uh, uh, we could not answer in this uh, short period of time. Um, uh, thank you for all three of our uh, speakers. And um, maybe I just want to have a, a short uh, very, very quick um, concluding comment uh, from maybe from me, from listening, is that um, we have to, uh, of course, history is not just in books. Uh, the, uh, you have, all three of you have um, shown that physical objects like the statues of, of specific people uh, can become uh, important emotional and, um, and important symbols of history and a way to keep uh, history and heritage uh, current and, to sh and, and showing that it has um, uh, a public ownership, that history is, is, is owned by the public. It's not just uh, in books, but it's, and, it's um, and it influences us today, something that happened three, four, 500 years ago. Um, Thank you, everybody, and thank you for everybody who listened. And uh, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll all meet again um, virtually on uh, on another occasion. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Lina. Success. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lina. <laughs>